Woody Woodhouse is here. Many of you know, one of the, the last living heroes of Tuskegee, Airmen, 90. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 96 years of age, 96, and he made it all the way here for you, Your Honor, because he's a huge fan of yours, and he wanted to make sure that he was here to say thank you for all that you are doing for our great city. I'm going to ask, before I say a few words, I'd like to think he's the Tom Brady, but Brady's retired. I'm not asking him to retire, but he has been the quarterback of the New England Council. The successes that we've had over the years uh, is a team effort, but also our quarterback and our leader and the chairman. So I'd like to introduce him for some brief remarks. Uh, and that's John Heiler. Everybody knows Jim loves a hug. Come here, Jim. <laughs> Um, seriously, Jim, thank you. Um, I wasn't going to say anything today, um, but when I saw the turnout, um, I thought it was really appropriate to kind of set the morning off right. Uh, this turnout is indicative of the way the New England Council looks at the city of Boston and as a real economic engine um, for all of New England. And so what happens in Boston affects all of us, no matter where our businesses are housed, where our workers are. And the issues of affordable housing, of infrastructure, of affordable transportation, um, all of these things are really key to the success of our businesses, our institutions. Um, and we've got a cross section here that's really unbelievable when you think about it. We have the medical, hospitals, biotech, health sciences, we have the unions, we have real estate, we have developers, we have lawyers. You look across the board, you have tech, finance, academic institutions that are second to none in the world. That's the city of Boston. And I say that because we have an opportunity here. And Mayor, we we'll thank you for attending. It's a real honor to have you here. Um, And I will tell you, we've never had a turnout for an event like this. Our biggest annual dinner is 1,800, um, over 500 today, which says um, the importance that Boston has on this organization and your role as a leader of that city. Um, I want to end with knowing that people are in this room to hear your message, to hear um, what you see for Boston and for New England, always realizing, and I think we all do, um, it's a global city that has an impact all over the world. And we, we are here to figure out how to help you on your goals and your missions to set Boston up, not only from a business perspective, but from a social community perspective. If communities are strong, we're stronger. And so any way we can be of help, that's what we're here for. So again, thank you for being here today. Well, as the chairman indicated, this is an incredible uh, attendance here today, and it's, it's reflective on, obviously, our guest speaker and our friend, the mayor. But we're also uh, very grateful to Amalgamated Bank for generously uh, supporting this morning's breakfast. America's largest socially responsible bank, Amalgamated Bank, was founded a century ago by the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America and is now the largest certified B Corp bank in the United States. The bank joined the New England Council early last year and has been an active and engaged member since that time. We are particularly honored to be joined today by the bank's CEO, Priscilla Sims Brown, who will introduce our very special guest in just a moment. She herself is a multinational board director and C-suite executive with 30 years of financial service experience. Under Priscilla's leadership, the bank became one of the best performing bank stocks in the United States in 2022. Now 2023 has gotten off to a very busy start 
for the New England Council. We have a full calendar in the next couple of weeks. Here in New England, looking forward to events with Congressman Joe Courtney and Senator Angus King. And in Washington, D.C., next week, we will host Senator Maggie Hassan and following week, Representative Annie Custer. We're also very much looking forward to 2023 Washington Leaders Conference to take place on May 10th and 11th in our nation's capital. Registration will very soon be available as well as sponsorships. As always, you can find more details and register for our upcoming events on our website, newenglandcouncil.com. Well, today we're delighted to welcome the mayor of this great city, Michelle Wu. The mayor was kind enough to join us last fall at our annual celebration, and we were delighted to hear more today on the mayor's initiatives, as the chairman says, to drive economic growth here in this wonderful city, Boston. I thank you again for joining us today, and pleased to hand it over now to Priscilla Sims Brown. Wow, look at this turnout, huh? Uh, you're, you're here all because um, the Great Breakfast, or <laughs> you're here because the Amalgamated Bank invited you? No, you're here because we have an amazing opportunity today uh, to talk and think about uh, what we can and should do to support our mayor in this great city. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Amalgamated for those of you who may not know. Uh, you just heard that we're 100 years old, and that's true. We were started by the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union, uh, and really that's just a group of textile workers. They were immigrants. They came here, mostly from Eastern Europe, and they couldn't get banked, couldn't open accounts, couldn't raise capital for themselves uh, to support their livelihoods, mostly women who were working very hard but couldn't, uh, couldn't help their families grow. And so they decided to take matters into their own hands and start a bank. And this was the bank for the unbanked. But most of all, it was also the bank who would uh, take its deposits and use them for good in other ways. And so 100 years later, uh, we're still following that mission. We're a bank that uh, we're called America's socially responsible bank. What does that really mean? It means that we take appropriate positions to help progress uh, society, particularly for those who otherwise uh, would, not, would not get help. And we count as our clients, many of you in the room who are change makers yourself, uh, either as business people, uh, in most cases you are, but, but also those of you representing um, uh, a homeless shelter, a women's shelter uh, in Dorchester, someone who is concerned about health care uh, across the, the Commonwealth with 82,000 employees um, who live and work here and who need to thrive here. And so we're very proud to be in the Boston community. Um, we believe in working for a just transition um, in climate, and we do a lot of work around climate. Uh, we've endorsed the PRO, Act, uh, to the PRO Act to support the rights of organized labor. We still care about uh, workers' rights and, in fact, introduced a $15 minimum wage and then a $20 minimum wage. And today we think and act toward a living wage for all of our employees. We also think we have a responsibility to punch above our weight and to support businesses and clients who want to do the same. Um, that's why we're so excited to uh, both host this morning's uh, conversation, but also to welcome our mayor. Um, our expansion into the Boston area, which occurred about two years ago, reflects the broader success of the, of the Boston community. We believe that the accomplishments under Mayor Wu's administration affirm our belief that Boston is the right place for Amalgamated Bank um, for many of you and for more expansion to come. We think our employees will thrive uh, living and working in this community. Um, policy investments like Mayor Wu has established really do uh, put us on a path to sustainability. Her very first 
bill that she signed in December of 21 was an ordinance requiring the city of Boston to divest from fossil fuel, tobacco, and private prison industries by the end of 25. But most of you know that. Um, to meet our net zero targets, we really do need policy makers like her to enact for policy changes to ad urgently address our climate crisis, which is, which is becoming more urgent by the day, but particularly urgent for vulnerable communities like many of ours. Um, that's why we are excited to see Mayor Wu forwarding our shared commitment to ending our reliance on fossil fuel by making all new city construction and major renovations in our schools, municipal buildings, and public housing entirely fossil free. Leaders like this make me optimistic about Boston's future and its continued role as the engine for innovation and the hub for New England. So without further ado, I know who you're here to hear. Uh, let's bring up Mayor Wu. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I, it's thrilling to be in the company of so many people who care so passionately about our city and who work every day to ensure that our region continues to be a leading light across the country. Um, I will accept, um, as any politician is supposed to, the implication that I had anything to do with it. Uh, but really, I, I actually think one side, in, side effect of the pandemic, in addition to our, our, our recovery of, from it, in addition to wanting just to be together again and be in person again and, and seek the opportunities to be with our community, um, events have also started to start much later, which as a working parent, I love the 9.30 start rather than the 7.30, so if we can keep that, Jim, <laughs> you see the impact of that. Um, and to Priscilla, thank you for your leadership. Amalgamated is a trusted partner for, for um, our work in many ways. And what I so appreciate about your business and how you talk about the goals of your business is that, like the city of Boston, it is entirely centered around people. The origin story of wanting to do good and partner alongside workers in the community and now treating your own staff and workers with that same sense of purpose and possibility. Um, that, that is what I want to focus my remarks on today, is what, what does this region mean for people um, and the, the growth of our city cast in those terms. But thank you for being such a strong partner and, and our host and, and sponsor today. Um, to Lieutenant Colonel Woody Woodhouse, <laughs> my hero. <laughs> Um, he, I always have to check with him. I, he keeps a calendar that is way more packed than anyone else in this room. And so when it comes to some of the major events, I'll say, where are you going for a Veterans Day? Where are you going for this? And he says, I'm, I'm actually out of town. I'm at five events in a different part of the country or here. So what an honor and what a delight to see you here. We all are um, familiar and um, rightly hold up your heroism for your service to our country and what you continue to mean to all of us in the freedom that we often take for granted. But I just want everyone in this room to know that Woody also continued to give back even more after that service. And in fact, he was part of the city of Boston's workforce as the first black assistant corporation counsel for the city of Boston back in the day as well. And just a side note, um, a fan of Sullivan's at Castle Square, like my family, I, I run into him when he's there secretly, and he'll be surrounded by a crowd there. Um, to Jim, thank you for your leadership. John, thank you for your leadership as chair and to all of the board members of the New England Council and for your direct service uh, to the city of Boston, serving and making sure that our, our institutions, our library system, and so many other places have the, the support that they need. Thank you. Um, 
I'm, I want to recognize any elected colleagues who are in the room. I um, want to work alongside some incredible city council colleagues every single day. Our state legislature is a remarkable partner, and I saw several former uh, members of the legislature here, uh, from Kathy Reinstein and, and Rachel Caprelli, and um, I saw former Governor Weld here as well. I'm incredibly honored by his example and leadership. Um, I'm also joined here by colleagues from City Hall. So could everyone who works for the City of Boston now please stand up so we can thank you. Um, you just saw, uh, I think this is almost everyone on my list here, our Chief of Staff, Tiffany Chu, Chief of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, Shigun Iruwu, um, and his team members, Elijah and um, Alicia, who are here. Oh, no, no, I don't see Alicia. Uh, um, Aliyah, who is here, our Chief of Policy, Mike Firestone, our Chief of Worker Empowerment, Trin Nguyen, um, our new, uh, very, very, very exciting and grateful he's on the team, our new Director of Sports, Tourism, and Entertainment, uh, John Borders, is here. Uh, James Coleman from our Office of Global Affairs, um, Pilar, who is in, uh, Chief of Staff to our cor amazing Corporation Council, uh, Adam Cederbaum. Who am I missing? Uh, Lou Mandarini, our senior advisor for really all things people in the city of Boston, workforce, labor, and all of that. Um, did I miss anyone from the city? Oh, and Devin Quirk from the BPDA, who is helping to steward so many parts of how our city grows and how we think about that growth to be more sustainable, equitable, and uh, resilient for everyone every day. OK, now I'll dive in. Two weeks ago, I had the chance to give my very first State of the City address, to have the opportunity to share with Boston residents about the foundation that we've built with this incredible team, our agenda for a green and growing city, and most of all, what a tremendous gift it is to serve this community. I didn't get to focus on it then, but uh, what I want to talk a little bit about today is how grateful and how meaningful it is to do this work at this time a time of unique momentum alongside our state and federal partners. President Biden, who did a great job last, I don't know, mine was 30 minutes, I don't know how he went for 73 minutes and was just energetic the entire way through. Um, he has called our Massachusetts federal delegation the most powerful and most talented delegation in the country. Right? We all witnessed that statement at Logan Airport. That's something that we've known all along, but truly our delegation is delivering for us in this moment, and I want to thank the New England Council for your role in that advocacy as well. At the state level, our new governor and lieutenant governor are not only history makers as the first all-woman power duo to serve in the country, but they bring a deep familiarity with our region, with our center city, with the needs of all of our municipalities and all of our sectors and the collaborations that set us apart. But just days before our State of the City event in Boston, I was in DC for my very first US Conference of Mayors event, where it was clear in every conversation I had that in this moment of continued recovery and divided federal government, cities play an outsized role as hubs for regional leadership. And Boston's leadership ripples far beyond our borders. In conversations with fellow mayors and White House officials, I was constantly reminded of how lucky we are to be home to the institutional partners, the resources, the shared commitment that make us a national model for cities and region as engines of progress. Of course, I'm preaching to the choir here. The New England Council has been at the helm of growing that partnership for nearly a century. The oldest regional business alliance in the nation, the first to organize and keep that collaboration going building the advocacy that enables New England to set the standard for innovation, shared prosperity, and quality of life across the country. And so I'm incredibly honored to have the chance today to connect with you all as leaders and partners in business, academia, healthcare, labor, nonprofits, civic engagement, the pillars of our regional economy and community. And most of all, I'd like to thank you Thank you for your role in building the foundation that has not only anchored our region through recent challenges, but empowered us to redefine what's possible in the years ahead. 
Given Boston's role as driver of the New England economy, we monitor our city's workforce and downtown area and small businesses as important indicators of our region's broader economic health and progress. So reporting on a couple of these statistics as of the latest, um, our numbers as of December of 2022 show that Boston's unemployment rate was 2.9% back to pre-pandemic levels. But the size of the labor force hasn't rebounded to pre-pandemic levels. As is true nationally, many workers haven't returned to the workforce and aren't looking to come back. The most recent estimate of our regional workforce is still 214,000 people short of February 2020, a decline of more than 2.5%. At the same time, interest rates are driving up the cost to build, creating strong headwinds for our most urgent housing goals and, and other growth goals. Remote, hybrid, remote and hybrid work trends continue, and commuter trips into Boston are just half of what they were in 2019. Our downtown office vacancy rate is equivalent to more than one out of 10 office spaces in our city sitting empty. And I know many of you all as large employers are working to achieve that right balance and continuing that transition, so I wanna thank you. At the same time, a deeper look at the numbers shows steady recovery in the hospitality industry and those other industries that were hardest hit by the pandemic. So we're seeing that coming back. We see solid gains in our core sectors like healthcare and professional services, although we understand staffing to still be a, a daily challenge and the burst pipes at various of our institutions over the cold didn't help. But we also see rapid growth here in the New England region in innovation and life sciences. In these very sectors, I think it's important to highlight that these are some of the sectors where talent today is more mobile than ever before. And so at a time when more people can work from wherever they want, relative to where they live or where the physical building is that their company is headquartered in, and at, while every industry is looking to fill vacancies, it's our job to make Boston and New England the place people want to be, because then the opportunities will follow. The good news is that Boston and New England are already leading the way with the fundamentals in place, not just for today, but for tomorrow's jobs as well. We hear it all the time, but our institutions are not only some of the best around the globe individually, but collectively, we form a tightly knit community whose strength and mutual support is second to none. Our colleges and universities, hospitals and healthcare centers, our business community, innovative and industry-leading life sciences sector and our residents over these 48 square miles that anchor the New England region, we have the intellectual capital, the resources and capacity, and the creative energy to drive the kind of growth, connectivity, and progress that our nation needs. And the energy behind all of that is our people. At the City of Boston, we're committed to doing everything possible to maintain and grow our standing as the most attractive region in the country for the most talented workforce in the world. And in City Hall, we are always trying to walk the walk first and start with what we can do as uh, an employer and participant in the market ourselves. We see growing our city workforce as an essential strategic objective, not just a back office administrative function, and so we are aligning our structure and resources with that perspective. We took what was formerly a process and payroll first department called administration and finance, uh, expertly stewarded by some folks in the room, I will add. Shout out to Dave and others. Um, we've taken that office and transformed it into a people first department. Our people operations cabinet led by the city's first ever chief people officer, Alex Lawrence, who's doing an incredible job. We created senior level strategic roles focused on workplace culture, employee relations, and workforce planning to map out our long-term hiring, retention, and representation, and launched a new paid training program called City Academy to fill critical, good-paying jobs with the city directly from our community members. We're working with our new Office of Blackmail Advancement to connect residents to these pipelines, including hosting career resource fairs for returning citizens and being out in the community working alongside organizations, including many of you all, with direct relationships. And we're investing in the policies and benefits to improve quality of life for our growing workforce as well, making sure that we can retain and support and provide professional development, as well as quality of life benefits from free bike share memberships and covering 65% of monthly MBTA, costs, uh, MBTA passes for our employees, uh, 
to an updated hybrid work policy and revamped paid parental leave policy that makes it easier for workers to support their families while focusing and doing their best at, at their jobs. We also know that it's not enough to simply lead by example. We need to be focusing our attention on the kinds of policies that will strengthen our workforce across the region. So a couple areas I'm going to get into. First is education. We know that strengthening our workforce overall means plugging gaps in our childcare and BPS uh, school and education system to address the fact that the pandemic has dealt an enormous blow to working families, particularly working women, particularly those with kids under the age of 10. And for families who are looking to grow, put down roots, and surround their children with opportunities. So we've invested millions in making dozens of new pre-K classrooms free for families across the city and partnered with community organizations and colleges to fund hundreds of new certificates, degrees, and licensure programs for early childhood educators to bolster Boston's early ed workforce and fill gaps that we see right now in our neighborhoods, all tuition free for those participants. We're also building an education system to match our role as the academic capital of the world. From plans for state-of-the-art BPS facilities and new electric buses, which will hit the roads this month, to programs training students to service these electric vehicles and partnerships with local universities to enable students to get a head start on college-level courses. And we're not just investing in wraparound supports to help our workers thrive, we're investing directly in jobs and training as well. More than $3 million has already gone to 24 partners for training for 1,500 middle class jobs over the course of the last year, from human services and technology to hospitality and healthcare. We're prioritizing opportunities for underrepresented residents in our life sciences industry through a $10 million partnership with employers and community partners to co-develop a curriculum and connect 1,000 Boston residents with life sciences jobs by 2025. In progress still, as you heard, where we see a need, we try to not only define how we can help from a policy angle, but to build the people and the workforce to close those gaps as well. In addition to our life sciences partnership, I'm really excited that we're continuing to work on building out our childcare workforce pipelines, city work pipelines, and also a, a new initiative that will come soon around behavioral health and mental health under our city's first ever chief behavioral health officer recognizing the dire need for clinicians and particularly clinicians of color, those who know our communities and are connected directly to our residents. The Boston Public Health Commission is undertaking an initiative that would similarly provide the connections to our local partners and institutions for training with a commitment that these jobs will stay in Boston with support for tuition and, and job placements. I'm going to keep hammering the next two. You know I'm going to talk about housing and transportation next. <laughs> uh, of course, these opportunities don't mean much if people can't afford to live here. Our housing crisis is driving homelessness up, school enrollment down, and families, artists, workers, and residents of color out. Alongside transit, it is the single biggest threat to our region's economy. Back in October, I signed an executive order to cut the approval process for affordable housing in half, taking it from an average right now of almost a year down to five to six months. In the months since, our teams led by uh, Sheila Dillon at the Office of Housing and Arthur Jemison over at the BPDA and our development review process, they have dug in to figuring out how to speed things up. And we're making great progress on this. Some, require, some changes in the policies will come soon, which include eliminating unnecessary studies for certified affordable housing developments or those that meet a certain equity and affordability scorecard, reducing comment periods, setting a predictable and guaranteed uh, number of community meetings, swapping impact advisory groups for a set package of community benefits, to ensure that we are defining the terms and then cutting the process around it. Streamlining this process will enable us to learn from these reforms and then apply that to simplify and accelerate all of our development processes to get good projects going faster everywhere across the city. And I hate to ruin a good breakfast with the T word, but we have to talk about traffic too. 
mobility is at the foundation of where people can live and where they can access opportunity. And it's worth noting that the solution is multimodal. We need to make walking, biking, and transit the first choice for your employees, for our workforce, for your customers, for partners across the region, for residents and families across the city. Last week, I was thrilled to get a call from Secretary Buttigieg with the news that Boston was awarded a $9 million Safe Streets grant to help reconstruct nine of our most inaccessible, most dangerous intersections in the city. Thanks to our federal delegation's advocacy on this and our team's work, we'll be able to lower the barriers to commuting on foot and by bike and for everyone to just ease a little bit of the snarling traffic that we experience trying to get to work or get to home. We'll be able to lower barriers from Andrews Square to Orient Heights, Codman Square, Bowdoin Geneva, Blue Hill Ave, Roxbury, Chinatown, and more throughout our city. And the impacts of this really will flow throughout the entire region. But to fully realize our potential as a world-class region, we must have more reliable public transit to get cars off the roads. Commuters can't be waiting 10 minutes for the next train at peak rush hour in a world-class city. And we won't rest until we get the resources we need to be able to build a system our residents and workers deserve, including a Boston seat on the MBTA board and the resources for our system to be functional, reliable, safe, convenient, and accessible. There is so much power in this room to shape the agenda across the entire Commonwealth and the entire region. And so truly, I ask for your continued partnership and support to ensure that we are prioritizing public transportation and housing as a make or break set of issues for our region. While so many other regions across the country are still trying to climb back to where they were, we are in a position that is by now familiar. We are in a position to lead. Here in New England, we draw from the strength of our partnerships and expand on the solid foundation that we built, and we know where we need to go. We've identified the challenges that we have to address together, and we have, even just in this room, the will, the resources, the talent, and the commitment to build a stronger future for all of us. Thank you so much for your partnership, and I look forward to the journey ahead. questions for you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, let me just ask a couple of questions and then open it up to the, the audience. Um, you touched on it. Uh, the best and the brightest of our region is in this room. And what message would you like to give them to help you on your agenda? You touched on the uh, piece of legislation adding Boston to the MBTA board. But this is an opportunity for you to say to these individuals who are gifted, uh, who want to help, because the bottom line is everyone in this room wants to see you succeed, because they love Boston, and they want Boston to succeed. So that's the question. What items would you like to see the business community help you embrace your vision going forward. Thank you so much. Well, I, I will just make a plug for our entire legislative agenda this year. We've taken a slightly different tack um, relative to how the city often interacts with the state. I think if you sometimes assume that things can get bogged down at a different level of government and act accordingly, then it can actually become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so rather than trying to mostly signal what we care about by putting out many dozens of items as a, a wish list, we really tried to focus. So there are just seven items on our legislative agenda this year at the State House compared to a, you know 70, 70 plus in, in previous years. And these items are bread and butter issues for the city, which really dovetail with what I have lined up. 
to on housing, including a, a provision that would add a very small transfer fee to sales of $2 million or more for housing that would generate the type of sustainable funding pipeline to replace what we are currently using from federal recovery funds and ARPA funds, that will, that, that will be used up in the next two to three years. And with that funding, we have been able to really transform what's possible on the housing side already. Just earlier last week, I celebrated with the team 114 units in East Boston that were able to be permanently made affordable. <laughs> Later, I think this week or next week, we will uh, talk about a way that we are going to aim for several hundred more units with the grant making that the office is able to do, not um, with the city taking on the entire cost ourselves. That is not our specialty of building and running and man managing everything, but providing that gap financing to empower and enable community-based developers, nonprofits, or um, or develop, private developers who are looking just for that extra bit of partnership, and that will go a long, long way. Similarly, in addition to the MBTA board provision, there's a provision around commuter rail to make that more accessible for all Boston residents, uh, a child care provision to close a loophole around how families who are uh, experiencing homelessness currently have to go through a full month period of process while they're applying for a child care voucher to be able to then get a start in looking for a job and, and looking for housing. Meanwhile, they have to somehow find a way to pay for child care for a month while they're waiting to get a child care voucher. And so we've been plugging that hole with our own ARPA funding in the meantime, but this would close that loophole from a legal standpoint. And so any of those seven items, we could really use your partnership up at the State House. Um, I will say the most important ask of this room from me though, is if you think about the chair that you are sitting in right now, in this incredible room of people and leaders who are in all of the other spaces here, think about your own personal journey and how you got to be sitting in this seat in this moment. For many of us in this room, this is something that I could never have imagined growing up, that I would even be inside a room like this with people like you all, much less having the chance to address you. Our Boston Public School students each and every one of them have the talent, the intellect, the brilliance to step into these seats as soon as they are old enough and as soon as we are making way for them. We just have to make sure we're creating the opportunities for them. You'll notice I, um, this might have been a little coordinated. Uh, I didn't mention the summer jobs thing in my speech because I knew I would be getting this question right afterwards. <laughs> Uh, we are setting a monster goal for summer jobs this summer. Should I say it? Trina, are we ready to say it? Sure. <laughs> I'll frame it this way. Um, in, in previous years, we had always aimed for something like 5,000 summer jobs for Boston students, Boston young people, and ended up having about 2,500 young people participate even though the goal was 5,000. The process is cumbersome. There's a lot of verification of this. If you think the affordable housing application approvals process is complicated, the summer jobs process similarly needs to be tightened up a whole lot, and that is what our team is working on this year. Um, last summer, we set a goal of 6,000. It was no excuses. We're going to have the bi big, biggest summer jobs program ever. And we went from having kind of plateauing at 2,500 to 3,500 young people participating. We are looking to at least double that this summer. So we have a little bit more work to do on our end of making sure our processes are smooth and streamlined, but now is the moment for us to really line up our partners because a huge part of this is having the opportunities that our young people would be excited to step into. And when I'm in classrooms with them, when I ask them, what, would, what, do, you, what do you want to do? What do you want to learn about? It's the very work that your organizations are doing. They, they don't want to be getting coffee. They don't want to be uh, just sitting around behind a, a, a counter somewhere or doing a retail job over the summer. They want to be in your offices and organizations making a difference and having an impact. And so we will, we've, we're putting together a, a more comprehensive and supported program than ever before and uh, we really ask for you to participate in that. Um, 
one of your uh, initiatives is to uh, take the underserved buildings downtown and uh, create some type of uh, apartment blocks that may generate into a 24-hour zone. Can you talk about that? And also, uh, part of that question would be, your goal is also to bring Boston back to a population of 800,000. Is, is this part of the in initiative too? One of the city, one of our region's greatest strengths is that we are a place that thinks not just about the different segments of your life separately, but how all of that fits together in quality of life. Not only do we have incredible work and job opportunities, but we are known for our arts and culture institutions, the um, safe and beautiful parks and open spaces that we have, the events and community organizations that fill in the gaps and so that you really can see every part of your humanity reflected in the opportunities that we have here. To get to 800,000 people, that will provide the resources for us to continue growing. That density and will support our small businesses, will make sure our school systems are functioning at full capacity with the resources and all the added benefits of having families together and connected to opportunity. But I think it's really important for us as a region to frame that in terms of people. Because we often talk about growth in terms of statistics or numbers, units or square feet that are needed. That is all, we are all tracking all, we're tracking all of those metrics as well. But when you talk about 800,000 people, that also must necessarily include the transportation infrastructure to get everyone around, the parks and the experiences and the uh, cultural assets and amenities that people need to feel welcome and to have fun in our city as well. And so that goal is really meant to be all inclusive. We are doing, again, recognizing this uncertain moment in the economy. Um, we are trying to do everything possible at the city side under our purview, making land available that is city owned that could be put right into the pot to ease budgets, simplifying and speeding up our processes, boosting home ownership so that more residents can stably stay in their, in their homes and in our city while we add, and add that growth. And looking at zoning as a major tool to boost our housing supply. Our goal is to focus on the citywide aspects of our zoning code that won't take, you know, we need to undergo a multi-year process anyway to get everything up to date, but even in the short term, we can look at neighborhood squares and corridors, the hubs and kind of commercial centers of each neighborhood where, it are, it, where density would actually be a necessary improvement for small businesses to have the foot traffic to keep their doors open. In doing that analysis, we know that we could generate tens of thousands of new housing units just by looking at our Main Streets districts alone. And by moving through that process, um, speeding everything up, our goal is that that will happen in the, in the very short term. We want to see major, major growth and in inroads before the next census count. When it comes to um, the downtown area in particular, this is a hub for the entire region. And we can no longer think about cities anywhere in the country as just tall office buildings in the middle that operate nine to five and then homes on, you know, in the surrounding areas that people kind of go back and forth between. Every part of our city has to be a destination, a residential neighborhood, and a place where people have fun all throughout the day and throughout the week and weekend. And so that's our goal. We know that there's um, multiple levers that we can pull in thinking about conversions or adding more uh, support for arts and culture to be more prominently a part of every neighborhood. Uh, that is a purview of, of our team and we're working closely. Welcome any other innovative ideas on how we can continue to push for downtown to come back, but also um, in some ways reshape what the experience is of that neighborhood as a, as a neighborhood connected to all of our other neighborhoods. One of the uh, pressing uh, issues that you are facing is the, the homelessness issue, mass and cast, done a terrific job in the last year, but it seems to be now creeping back up. Um, you have indicated that you need more support from the state. We have a new governor, you have a wonderful relationship with, with uh, her. What are you looking for in resources from the state? Yeah. Um, the state's been fantastic in supporting Boston's efforts over the last year or so. We have gone from a situation where there were entrenched permanent encampments, where people had been living in fortified structures for multiple years with horrific 
health situations. Fire, the fire department was responding almost every other day to a, a structure that had gone up in flames because of the propane heating tanks catching fire against uh, something in, in, in the structures. We had a, a rodent problem that was spreading all sorts of diseases that were preventable across, um, across our community and uh, a situation where for the residents seeking treatment, for the residents in the surrounding area, it, it, it's incredibly unsafe. Um, we obviously have not solved the underlying causes of homelessness and mental health and the opiate crisis. We look to continue tightening our work there every single day, but we no longer have permanent encampments in our city today. We do have a team that, uh, our coordinated response team works across city agencies, across community partners, our organizations on the ground where there's case management. Um, as of last night, 24 hour and evening case management as well, including through the weekends, thanks to some partnerships from the Boston Foundation and other organizations. And we now are looking individual by individual to connect people with resources. Of the 200 some low threshold supportive housing units that Boston created, none of which had existed prior to this, the results have been transformational in the ability for individuals in just a couple months to go from living on the street, transitional housing, to permanent housing, holding down a job or resources to help pay rent, and stably on the next chapter of their recovery. We need this everywhere across the Commonwealth. Our teams are serving every possible person, but we have wait lists because people are finding their way to the only part of the state that is really doing this in a comprehensive way right now. Uh, and we know from our numbers that the majority of people are coming in from outside the city of Boston. We appreciate and will always lean into our role as a center city to serve whoever finds their way here to our city and wants to be a part of our community. But it would make it much more accessible for everyone across the state if we could take this model that has worked so well already and make sure that people don't have to travel long distances just to come into Boston to access it. I'd be remiss if I didn't say uh, a job well done this past weekend with you and your staff um, with the Arctic frigid weather that we had city did a yeoman job, and um, <laughs> congratulations. And those individuals that work in that area are the unsung heroes, and uh, they make us proud. I'd also say a commercial for the health care for the homeless, Dr. Jim O'Connell. Extraordinary work. <laughs> and I might add, Mass General is very involved in the health care for the homeless, and we thank them for their continued support for that wonderful program. And uh, just a commercial, if you want to read a book about the homelessness issue, and you want to read a book about a living saint, Dr. Jim O'Connell, it's called Rough Sleepers. It's a term the British used back in the 18th century for homeless people. It's an extraordinary book, uh, and it just makes you feel proud. People like that exist in this city. So with the mayor, health care for the homeless, I think we're making some progress. With that, we have a chance to a couple of questions for the mayor. And if you have a tough question, identify yourself. <laughs> okay. Jerry Dentaline. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Madam Mayor. I appreciate your mention of Main Streets. Uh, very important. There are 20 districts around the city that support our retail and commercial uh, developments in the local communities. I, want, I know from this organization that many of the folks in financial services support those businesses in the districts, and that's so welcome. But under Chief Itawu, and I appreciate his leadership on the Main Streets front, what more can we do to bridge the larger businesses, that many of which are represented in this room, with the local communities? And of course, supporting your housing agenda, I know, is among them. But is there more that we can do to really introduce the business community to these folks who are supporting our city in such fundamental ways? Yeah, thank you so much, Jerry, for your leadership also and for always finding ways to take the platform that you have and, and direct it and shine the light on, on other causes that are important in our city. Um, I would say, this, the answer, the, the best answer, in fact, is the easiest. If you want to help with our main streets, 
go talk to Shagun and <laughs> find him at this event. I will, I'll try to channel a little bit of him um, in giving uh, some top lines. One is that we, we do need to fundamentally take a look at where our main streets are located, how they're working, and what equity looks like in the city's delivery of services to our small neighborhood businesses. That is underway under his leadership and his team. You know, for example, it's, it's because it has tended to be so, it has worked well because it is so neighborhood specific, but it is also a very different experience district by district in terms of the resources and um, how much the city is, is involved in supporting versus kind of just letting things happen. And so we want to make sure we're very proactively supporting everywhere possible. In fact, um, when many of the federal recovery programs became available, whether it was PPP or, or others, it was our Main Streets programs that were the only way certain Boston small businesses, particularly with language barriers or, um, or, or maybe not formally banked with a, a long time relationship with an institution, it was through our Main Streets programs that that direct outreach helped to close some of those gaps. So it's a critical, critical program that we want to see expand in other parts of the city. Some neighborhoods don't have Main Streets, but still have a commercial center. Some neighborhoods have a commercial center that's not fully encapsulated by the Main Streets programs. So we're doing some work internally there. I know I could feel his message uh, through my brain of the space grants and the space grant program as well that um, in fact this moment of stress that we are experiencing with vacancies in staffing and vacancies in retail storefronts we have to seize as an opportunity. The city is creating a, a, a way for businesses, entrepreneurs, to expand particularly in some of the vacant high traffic areas of the city Think about downtown Seaport, Newbury Street, um, and ensure that our residents of color, particularly black and brown owned businesses, local businesses who are looking to expand or add a second location or get their new concept up and running, that we can help support that transition, anchor them in those new spaces. And so help spread the word about that program. You could. We are doing what we can with the funding that we have to support a certain number of businesses in that. If we had interest, we could certainly expand, build on the infrastructure that we have, and help support a whole lot more small businesses in filling up these vacant store, uh, retail storefronts. And so I will make that pitch, whether it is for our space grant program to connect folks to vacant spots, or for our commercial acquisition program, where we're helping small business owners acquire their properties and have that full stability particularly to generate wealth and pass that on and keep that in our community. We could do a whole lot more if there were public-private partnerships expanding the pot of funding that was available. We have time for maybe two. We have time for uh, two quick questions. Mr. President. Mayor Wu, it is so inspiring to hear your vision uh, for the city. My name is Mahesh Das. I'm president of the Boston Architectural College. And uh, we are proud employers of uh, students in summer, so we participated in the program that you mentioned. And we look forward to, uh, you know, interning more people, uh, more students uh, and this summer with urban design. Uh, so my question is, how could we partner with you to flesh out a comprehensive vision for the city and make it accessible and share it with the public? Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to make it so that every time someone asks a question here, they regret it later because then we just went all in. Because there's so much that we will partner with you on um, and and draw from the resources that your institution has. In fact, uh, one of the exciting staff changes in, on the BPD and Devin and Arthur's team is the creation of a new role or director of urban design, Diana Fernandez Bibo, who um, is leading over the course of this year a citywide design study for our neighborhoods. And the goal is to foster a set of parameters that will establish a clear um, way to, to have predictability and what the design process will look like, you know, again, to streamline processes, but also to really ground our projects in the unique ethos and identity and uh, everything from materials and design of our particular communities. What is special about Boston is that there is, in fact, so much connection to the local 
ownership of what it means to live in East Boston relative to Mission Hill or West Roxbury or Roxbury. And we want that to be reflected in every part of the aesthetic of the city as well and in ways that will simplify the process as we go. So to partner with you and with your students and with your, your faculty on how we establish the right balance of having those parameters so that we don't just have boxy buildings that are kind of generic and could be anywhere that fit the neighborhood, but also encourage experimentation and beauty and, and maybe a little risk in some of the architectural choices that are made as well. Um, I love the new BU um, data sciences building. I think it's an incredibly striking addition to our skyline. We need to see more like that. Two quick questions, young lady here and then Gary. Yeah, just wait for the mic and you can identify yourself. And then we'll wrap it up with Gary Kaplan. Hi, I'm Christy Kaufman. I'm the brand new CEO of Brighton Marine. You had mentioned uh, trying to get the numbers back up to eight, 800,000, I think, as a population. How can we be helpful in regards to that veteran population, the military population? We know that in Mass and in Boston, it's dropping quicker than it is across the country. So for those of us who are in the military veteran space, how can we be helpful in helping hang on to the people that are stationed here, potentially, and, and keeping veterans in Boston? Let's talk because um, that would be incredible to come up with a specific strategy and I know exactly the team members who will, will connect with you. Um, you all are, have already been a model for a lot of the work that we are undertaking. For example, at Mass and Cass, the model that you all have at Brighton Marine in terms of the hub and spoke resources where it's one point of contact and someone can access housing assistance and job counseling and uh, transportation all through one direct streamlined program, that is the model that we are aiming for as we deliver services at Mass and Cass and, and really are following your lead. Um, if we could have more Brighton Marines, if we could have more places where we're partnering specifically for that affordable, affordable housing mix of transitional into um, supportive, into permanent housing, all on the same site, so people are already comfortable and wrapped around with the resources, I would love to find ways to expand that. I just want to give one commercial, um, and that's because this is a great city, and the reason it's a great city, we have these wonderful people who are caring, compassionate, and wonderful organizations, and high on my list is Home Base. I can't say enough. They are affiliated, Mass General, the Boston Red Sox. What they do for returning Afghan and Iraqi veterans and their families is a national model, nationally recognized, and it's here in Boston, and we're blessed to have them. But the work that they do, these people are heroes, they, they protected us, and uh, there's an obligation that we need to help them now. And uh, General is here, General Jack Hammond, who travels all over the country, talking about the program, here in Boston, started in Boston, because of the generosity of Mass General, Boston Red Sox, and other people. So we're blessed. Gary Kaplan, you have the last question. The governor, uh, the mayor turned to me and said, I have a two o'clock appointment. She doesn't want to be late. So, quickly, ask your question. And yes, I think she said yes. The Thank you, Jim. Is that two o'clock appointment today or tomorrow? <laughs> it, it, it's today. I just want to ask a question about education. Uh, you talked about summer jobs, which is an important element of workforce development. But the entire K-12 education system is our workforce development system. That's right. And the Boston Public Schools have been through a lot of turmoil in the past several years. And student achievement is not where it should be, partly because of the pandemic, but it's been that way for a long time. Do you have any specific educational initiatives that you want to put forward to uh, rebuild the academic foundation of the Boston Public Schools? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of different angles that we're coming at this from. Uh, first is just we, we are blessed as a city to uh, have snagged Superintendent Mary Skipper back to the Boston Public School System where she really grew up as a teacher, school founder, administrator. Um, she's, she's amazing. 
she, um, I think similar to the ethos of our administration, has been thinking about the structure, what, what are the, bar the challenges that we need to change in terms of how we do the work, how we partner with schools, and then um, the actual kind of delivery of teaching and learning. And so structure-wise, she's revamped her leadership team um, rather than just having some focus on, um, you know, finances and some focus on operations and some focus on uh, compliance with state standards. There's actually a, a very cross-departmental uh, collaborative refocusing of that. So there's a new um, chief of schools whose sole job is to ensure resources get pushed down to the school level and be that point of contact. So there's no longer a feeling of disconnect and who do I talk to. There's a chief of academics, a new position that was created specifically to focus on this, you know, not getting pulled into the building issues or facilities needs or, or operational um, pieces of it. There is a chief of operations to manage all of that. And then there is someone who is overseeing our Green New Deal for BPS, which is the entire facilities uh, revamp that is tied in with grade configurations and many other, other um, changes that we need on the physical plant of our buildings. Within the chief of academics um, cabinet, there's, a, there's a, been a strong need for back to basics in a lot of ways. I think it's been, you know, I spent a lot of time going school by school by school, trying to sit with any of our educators and students and school nurses who would talk to me over a number of years just to absorb. And what I heard was that it has been incredibly destabilizing. We've had great leadership, but such a quick um, revolving door of folks that even I highlighted one school project at the state of the city over a span of a number of years that could have been one, the tenure of one superintendent, Boston has had seven, right? And so that constant in and out has, has not translated into a sense of the district having a cohesive academic goal. The back to basics goal has been around equitable literacy. Now, literacy we know is foundational for our third graders to be at reading level really defines the outcomes for the rest of their academic shapes, the outcomes for the rest of their academic career. But we mean literacy not just as in letters into words, into sentences, but the comprehension and communication skills that apply to every subject. So there's been an intensive model where teachers, which if you ask edu many educators, they'll say the best way that I get better is when a peer comes, observes me, and offers feedback and coaching. So we are pouring resources into coaches for teachers with, with this equitable literacy frame to look at the curriculum so that it is accessible and meaningful to our students, and then to provide each school with a plan to get that underway. This will be the focus for the next, I think, one to two or three years, and then we're in the process of choosing the math curriculum that will layer on top of that for a citywide, cohesive, this is a direction, here's how all the pieces fit together, and on and on and on. Um, at the same time, we've attacked some of the structural issues that have been a real challenge. Um, contracts, uh, union contracts and legal documents sometimes are just so technical that you know, people don't talk about them in the policy, but in fact, we had a landmark opportunity and came to an agreement with our teachers union around completely reshaping how special education can be staffed and run. Previously, there were provisions in the contract that had frozen certain things around staffing levels in very specific ways that the end result, even though the initial motivation was to not overwhelm any educator, the end result was that our, we siloed and segregated services by type of need. And so if your child has an individualized education plan for autism, these are the only schools that they can get treated at, or if it was dyslexia or a certain other type of need that you are legally and deserve the resources for, you had to get bused to a particular location to access that, rather than the services following each student and families being able to make choices based on the entirety of their lives. That is a huge change in the teacher's contract, a huge leap of faith from our educators, and I am I've promised them that we are going to do right by them. We're in the process of revamping this over the next three to five years with a $50 million commitment behind it as well. Changing how we staff special education will change our transportation needs and staffing. It will change all of our classroom staffing. And so our goal is not to 
have special education separate from English language learners, separate from other students, but for us to have high academic standards in every single classroom, and then for students who need additional services or other services, that comes to them. We have time uh, for a photo, uh, a couple of photos if you're interested uh, with, with uh, Her Honor. I thank you, Your Honor, uh, for selecting uh, Mary Skipper. Uh, she is gifted, she is uh, visionary to say the least, and she's also Dorchester. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dorchester. I think Ward 7, Precinct 9, but uh, with that, again, Your Honor, it, we enjoyed listening to your uh, initiatives and your uh, agenda going forward. We look forward to uh, having you back in the very near future. And uh, with that, I thank all of you. But if you want a quick picture with the mayor or myself, I'll, I'll stay to the last, last photo. But more importantly, the mayor. Thank you.